अहम भंटे ती सरटे न सह पंच शीलानी याचामी द्वितीय एम पे अहम भंटे ती सरने न सह पंच शीलानी याचामी तृतीय एम पे अहम भंटे ती सरने न सह पंच शीलानी याचामी नमो तस भगवत अर्हत नमो तस भगवत अर्हत सम्मा नमो तस भगवत अर्हत सम्मा गच्छामि आमा समाधि कामेशु मिच्छा चारा वे रमणि शिखा पदं समाधियामि मुसावादा वे रमणि शिखा पदं समाधियामि मुसावादा वे रमणि शिखा पदं समाधियामि सुरा मेरया मंजपमादखाना वे रमणि शिखा पदं समाधियामि सुरा मेरया मज्जपमादठाना वे रमणि शिखा पदं समाधियामि इमानि पञ्च शिखा पदानि शीलेन सुखतिं यन्ति शीलेन भोग सम्पदा शीलेन निपुटिं यन्ति तस्मा शीलं सोधये साथ 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 Sutta, the exposition of non-conflicts. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Savati in Dieter's Grove and at Sapindika's Park. There the Blessed One addressed the Bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, Venable Sir, they replied, and the Blessed One said this, Bhikkhus, I shall teach you an exposition of non-conflict. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the Bhikkhus replied, the Blessed One said this, One should not pursue sensual pleasure, which is low, vulgar, coarse, ignoble, and unbeneficial. And one should not pursue self-modification, which is painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial. The middle way, discovered by the Tathagata, avoids both extremes, giving vision, giving knowledge. It leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. Note 1257. This is substantially identical with the proclamation with which the newly enlightened Buddha opened his first discourse to the five bhikkhus before teaching them the, noble, the four noble truths. End of note. One should know what it is to extol and what it is to disparage. 
And knowing both, one should neither extol nor disparage, but should teach only the Dhamma. One should know how to define pleasure, and knowing that, one should pursue pleasure within oneself. One should not utter covert speech, and one should not utter over shaft speech. One should speak unhurriedly, not hurriedly. One should not insist on local language, and one should not override normal usage. This is the summary of the exposition of non-conflict. One should not pursue sensual pleasure, which is low, vulgar, coarse, ignoble, and unbeneficial. And one should not pursue self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, the pursuit of the enjoyment of one whose pleasure is linked to sensual desires. 1258 says... This is a more complicated expression for the pursuit of sensual pleasure. Low, vulgar, coarse, ignoble, and unbeneficial is a state beset by suffering, vexation, despair, and fever. It is the wrong way. 1259 says, MA is beset by suffering, vexation, etc. Through the suffering and vexation, etc. Of its results and the suffering and vexation, etc of its attendant defilements. Disengagement from the pursuit of the enjoyment of one whose pleasure is linked to sensual desires, low, vulgar, coarse, ignoble, and unbeneficial, is a state without suffering, vexation, despair, and fever, and it is the right way. Uh, The pursuit of self-mortification, painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial, is a state beset by Mm -hmm. suffering, vexation, despair, and fever, and it is the wrong way. Disengagement from the pursuit of the self-mortification, painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial is a state without suffering, vexation, despair, and fever, and it is the right way. So it was with reference to this that it was said, one should not pursue sensual pleasure, which is low, vulgar, coarse, ignoble, and unbeneficial. And one should not pursue self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble and unbeneficial. The middle way discovered by the Tathagata avoids both these extremes, giving vision, giving knowledge. It leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, it is this, this noble hateful part that is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindful, and right concentration. So it was with reference to this that it was said the middle way discovered by the Tathagata avoids both these extremes to Nibbana. One should know what it is to extol and what it is to disparage. And knowing both, one should neither extol nor disparage, but should teach only the Dharma. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, how, because, does they come to be extolling and disparaging and failure to teach only the Dharma? When one says, all those engaged in the pursuit of enjoyment of one whose pleasure is linked to sensual desires, low and unbeneficial, are beset by suffering, vexation, despair, and fever, and they have entered upon the wrong way, one thus disparages some. When one says, all those disengaged from the pursuit of the enjoyment of one whose pleasure is linked to sensual desires, low and unbeneficial, are without suffering, vexation, despair, and fever, and they have entered upon the right way, one thus extols some. When one says, All those engaged in the pursuit of self-mortification, painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial, are beset by suffering, vexation, despair, and fever, uh, and they have entered upon the wrong way. One thus disparages some, and one says, all those disparaged from the pursuit of self-mortification, painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial, are without suffering, vexation, despair, and fever, and they have entered upon the right way. One thus extols some. When one says, all those who have not abandoned the fetter of being, not 1, 2, 60, this is craving from being. Just below, we should read again, Bhava Sam yeah 
Janam as against BTS Viva Vasa Janam and or not are beset by suffering, vexation, despair and fever and they have entered upon the wrong way one thus disperges some when one says all those who have abandoned the feather of being are without suffering, vexation, despair and fever and they have entered upon the right way one thus stole some this is how there comes to be extolling and disparaging and failure to teach only the Dhamma. And how bhikkhu does there come to be neither extolling nor disparaging, but teaching only the Dhamma? When one does not say all those engaged in the pursuit of enjoyment of one whose pleasure is linked to sensual desire have entered upon the wrong way, but say instead the, pursu the pursuit is a state beset by suffering, vexation, despair and fever, and is, it is the wrong way, then one teach only the Dhamma. Note 1261 that is, extolling and disparage come about when one frame one statement in terms of person, some of whom are praised and others blamed. One teach only the Dhamma when one frames one statement in terms of state Dhamma, the mode of practice, without the explicit reference to a person. End of notes. <laughs> When one does not say, all those disengage from the pursuit of enjoyment of one who pleasure is linked in sensual desire, have entered upon the right way, but say instead, the disengagement is a state without suffering, vexation, despair, and fever, and it is the right way, then one teach only the Dhamma. When one not say, all those engage in the pursuit of self-mortification, and have entered upon the wrong way, but say instead, the pursuit is a state beset by suffering, vexation, despair and fever, and it is the wrong way, then one teach only the Dharma. When one does not say, all those disengaged from the pursuit of self-mortification have entered upon the right way, but say instead, the disengagement is a state without suffering, vexation, despair and fever, and it is the right way, then one teach only the Dharma. Uh, but, uh, I mean, we are reading this part, but uh, I... I think uh, I would need a, like a just a simple explanation of what uh, what's in these uh, in these paragraphs about um, extolling and uh, parodying. When is when is one uh, disparaging and extolling basically? Well, when we're first to people, uh -huh. not really the dhamma to talk about uh, talk about people as being on the right way or that sort of thing. It's interesting because the last thing the Buddha says in the sutta is somewhat contradicting what he says, or it, it appears to be showing a, a way in which you can talk about people that's okay, or you talk about individuals, I guess, but it's kind of the generalization. You know, it's not really accurate to talk about how people are on the right way because of, of certain things. I, I'm a little bit, it's a little bit odd the way this it is explained, but uh, it could just be down to an understanding of the language. I think it's about uh, teaching the Dhamma without uh, hurting people's egos or praising people or making people uh, egoistic or hurting their ego because this is about uh, non-conflict, right? Exposition of non-conflict. Yeah. So. But if you look at the last thing in the Sutta the Buddha says, it's actually pretty Praising someone. Yeah, praising someone when they deserve praising. But if you would like generalize like all those who Yeah, that's uh, why I think it's the more focused on the generalization or the blanket statements, but it's not even so much that because the blanket statements aren't really wrong per se. Like uh, someone is on the wrong path if they have the wrong views, if they are attached, clinging to sensuality. It's characteristic of the Buddha not to talk about things being right or wrong generally, or um, but to talk about what leads to suffering. Right? Notice how, the, how he phrases it. This leads to suffering. This leads to freedom from suffering. Uh, so, so yes, uh, it is clear that one... I mean, one only teaches the Dharma if uh, they are objective and not subjective right yeah not focused on people mm -hmm. i think it may be what's kind of not exactly clear when you read it um is that this these are abstractions of how a person phrases and uh, and and denigrates others like these specific examples of how you do it might be a little bit more more related to the person but these are just 
when you generalize it's it's these kind of these kind of things. Like if you if you woke up to a person who uh, who is like uh, having the party enjoying himself hey you are suffering <laughs> and he learn any dhamma from that yeah what are you talking about yeah it kind of misses the point when you say a person is uh, a person is on the wrong way because a person doesn't exist and the person can't really be on the wrong way or the right way so i don't know that the buddha hasn't taught and doesn't teach in in both ways but i think the point is somewhere in there where it's you you teach the Dhamma and you present it as what is right, what is true as true, and what is false as false, as opposed to trying to make ju past judgments, which Sankar reminds us can cause conflict. There's less conflict if you just stick to the Dhamma, is the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that will bring people to the Dhamma more instead of like, going against their. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. It's quite a common common teaching tool to uh, almost as though you're hinting at you you bring up a, t a topic that is pertinent to individuals rather than talking about the individuals. So you tell people something indirectly. you tell them that, give them a teaching that applies to them without explicitly talking about it as being about them. It uh, doesn't and give them the opportunity to say, "I'm not like that." I didn't say you were. It it just seems so difficult to do. Also, uh, it could be the case that uh, the context of the sutta is about uh, managing people who are sensitive. Maybe there are those some people who are sensitive. Yeah. Monks who are getting into conflicts by being too direct. Yeah. Isn't extol and disparaging means like, you know, you're praising people for your, like, you know, uh, to, to, to mislead and also looking down, extol means looking down on the people? Yeah, there's the idea of conceit. That's aspect of it. But again, I think the, the sutta is referring to the conflict that it causes. Of course, conceit is one of the problems with conceit is the conflict it causes. So conceit could be a reason that someone speaks in this sort of way. No one does not say, all those who have not abandoned the fetter of being have entered up in the wrong way, but says instead, as long as the fetter of being unabandoned, being too is unabandoned, then one teaches only the Dhamma. When one does not say, all those who have abandoned the fetter of being have entered up in the right way, but says instead, when the fetter of being is abandoned, being also is abandoned. Then one teaches only the Dhamma. So it was with reference to this that it was said, one should know what it is to extol and what it is to disparage. And both, one should neither extol nor disparage, but should teach only the Dhamma. Another thing about this is, suppose um, suppose someone is on the wrong way, and you teach it like that, you say, oh, people who are doing it this way are on the right way, and people who do this are on the wrong way. That, that can often discourage, lead to people to feel discouraged, or feel low self-esteem, feel bad about themselves. It doesn't provide the same direction as if you say, this is the right way to allow people to 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 correct themselves. It it points out their flaws and can be discouraging and, and demotivating when you talk, especially because of how it relates to people. You're you're saying you are this sort of person. You are the wrong sort of person. And persons, because they're concepts that you they don't, they can't they they, they persist. It, it it doesn't describe reality, but it describes a sort of um, immutable like I am. Well, if I am this, how can I change? It's kind of related to the, or like the problem with uh, um, when you diagnose a person as being this or that mental illness, and then they can just continue throughout their life to reaffirm that and say, I am this type of person. I am that type of person. I have this problem. I have that problem. It's kind of immutable and can be dis discouraging. 
in a, in a way that prevents or, or hinders their practice? One should know how to define pleasure and knowing that one should pursue pleasure within oneself. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, because there are these five chords of sensual pleasure. What five? Form, cognizable by the eye. Sounds, cognizable by the ear. Others, cognizable by the nose. Flavors, cognizable by the tongue. Tangibles, cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of lust. These are the five chords of sensual pleasure. Now, the pleasure and joy that arises dependent on these five chords of sensual pleasure are called sensual pleasure, a filthy pleasure, a coarse pleasure, an ignoble pleasure. I say of this kind of pleasure, that it should not be pursued, that it should not be developed, that it should not be cultivated, and that it should and that it should be feared. So happiness might be a little bit better. Not all of the, I mean, the sensual pleasures are we refer to them as pleasure, but he's talking more philosophically in in a way, or or more general about suffer about uh, happiness. So pleasure is a type of happiness, and these pleasures of the senses are problematic. They lead to addiction. But there's a type of happiness that doesn't rather but, than talking about a type of pleasure that doesn't it's more the happiness of, of the of meditation basically but, freedom but these, these are especially uh, throughout through the senses these are especially a resultant right like you can it's how can you say that um you are i mean you are p- pursuing those if they are just no. resultant Result, resultants are neutral for example if you see something seeing is neutral always the common talk is neutral but if it turns into a thing there's there is something there's screaming there because if that uh, that moment has passed that is resultant moment has passed and you are perceiving it as something it gives rise to well, pers- pursuit is i mean it's this it's not quite abhidhamma what the buddhist speaking here is his pursuit is desire for you it i mean technically from the abhidhamma yes it arises based on you you think of something and it brings you pleasure and you like that pleasure and then there is action to receive more of it but how it practically uh, appears is that you're seeking out pleasure and technically it comes from from memories from thoughts that that please you that you like and the like spurs you to do things which look like chasing after more pleasure I and mean, practically that's what it is it's just chasing after pleasure so don't think in terms of abhidhamma here just think in terms of daily life when you you crave food and so you seek it out or you crave music and so you seek it out and what's bad about them is that they are impermanent suffering itself so. oh, um just a little bit of clarification so pursuing them uh, pursuing these uh, sensual pleasures are first you know, the mind the thought the craving is a loss to the attachment right well technically no if you're talking in terms of actual abhidhamma then it's it's not pursuing it's the, the liking so th- it's, it's the, kar- it the, the, the karma reaction. that comes from that is the is the the karma that comes from that is the pursuing it's the reaction right this is this is the karma and he's talking about the pursuit is the karma oh okay but it's not quite so technical i mean kind of it is yeah it's that karma kama uh-huh. vipaka uh, kilesa kama vipaka it's like kilesa leads to kama kama leads to vipaka vipaka leads to kilesa and here it specifically says the pleasure and joy that arise dependent on this five cause of sensual pleasure so if a uh, joy arises based on that uh, feeling that means there's already already greed there unless we are talking about the uh, mental result that arises in you because let's say you eat something tasty or you smell something nice and joy arises I mean, there's already greed i mean you already reacted to it you and according I mean, to me i mean i mean you you cannot say that whenever joy arises that's unwholesome not, not, that's not whenever, un- not whenever sure. joy arises but here it here let's say dependent sensual pleasure so if you taste something sweet and if joy arises that is joy based on greed yeah Unless... I, just, I, i think the i think it's helpful to again talk about happiness as being either good or bad pleasure is generally a word we reserve for the bad kind for the kind that not the bad kind but the kind that is subject to attachment 
for the jhanas, there is like the first jhana has somanasa, second, third, all have somanasa, but it's the, the somanasa isn't the important part. It's the happiness, and it's mostly the happiness of how the, the jhanas, as in the meditations, relate to freedom. Like he says, uh, the bliss bliss isn't the right word. I mean, focusing on the bliss is is problematic because even the jhanas, the bliss of the the happiness, the somanasa, can be a cause for for clinging, for desire, for wanting it again, and for getting stuck on it, com- becoming complacent. So the word is just sukha, which is happiness, and I think it's a little more philosophical or a little bit general talking about how this is happy because well mainly because of the freedom from the hindrances but more specifically because of the wisdom the clarity how the mind is is present how the mind is subject the happiness of enlightened i would i would use happiness if i were to turn to pleasure for the what we just read yeah those are the pleasures so the 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 feeling the feeling of uh, the pleasant feeling pleasant feeling isn't synonymous with happiness uh, but pleasant fe- feeling is also not uh, equal with uh, unwholesomeness. It's not nothing no, wrong. but it's it, well, it's the kind. It's what leads to unwholesomeness. It's could the, could lead to yes. So it's dangerous. It's not to say that you're always going to crave it. It's not to be pursued. That's the whole point. Pursuing is generally going to desire. Yeah. So so basically, the my question was like, what what is this pursuing? The, like, what what is that exactly? And you said the, the karma. Well, it's yeah, the karma based on the reactions, the reaction. Of yeah. The... Here, bhikkhus, uh, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana the second jhana, the third jhana, the fourth jhana. This is called the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment. I say of this kind of pleasure that it should be pursued, that it should be developed, that it should be cultivated, and that it should not be feared. So it was with reference to this that it was said, one should know how to define pleasure, and knowing that one should pursue pleasure within oneself. See there, that that's what I mean. That I would rather translate that as happy. It makes more sense. You shouldn't really pursue pleasure. It's just not quite accurate. Pursue happiness. That makes more sense. Because happiness is more all encompassing or more more to the point. It's less about it's not about feeling pleasure. That's not what you should pursue. But you should certainly not pursue feelings of pleasure. Pursue happiness, which is more about peace, more about clarity, freedom, the sense of feeling and, and in and in, and in this case it's about the jhanas right i think the jhanas are used to make a point like they're, they're they because they relate to enlightenment mm-hmm. the jhanas are a, a description of path the, the aspect of the path that is happy that is peaceful as you take the fourth jhana there's no technically pleasure there's a neutral but you could still very of course call that happiness mm. And That's because true. it's on, it's involved with when used properly. It's involved with letting go, with freedom. It's uh, it's not dangerous. Opposite of danger, safe. Nita, so I, I would say I would say more important for the part of it not being dangerous, for the part of it being able to pursue or worth pursuing, is not the jhana part. It's the enlightenment part. But the jhanas are the description of how that that pursuit of enlightenment. That's what you should pursue, of course, not the pleasure of jhana. You should pursue enlightenment. And that pursuit is happy, is, is you could say pleasurable, but the pursuit is safe. It's not dangerous. It's the right way because it's enlightenment. So basically, uh, it is saying that don't be afraid of pleasure, unlike... Well, I mean, I, again, I would phrase it a little more like seek out enlightenment and the path to enlightenment is uh, is not dangerous. It's not liable to lead you to attachment and craving even though it can be quite pleasant pleasant and very happy very caught up with happiness the happiness of the jhana it's just saying again this is the this is the type of happiness this path to enlightenment is the kind of involves the kind of happiness that is free from danger and basically because it is kusala okay it comes to sensual pleasures yeah. well happiness. maybe also it more than just kusala it's uh, wisdom involved with wisdom and because wisdom lets go, there's no danger. It's the opposite of dangerous, freeing, freeing you from danger. The actual pleasant, the actual happiness, this happy path is also freeing you from attachment to happiness. Of course, the more free from attachment you become. The- one should not utter covert speech, and one should not utter overt sharp speech. So it was said. And with reference to what was it said, here because when one knows covert speech to be untrue, incorrect, and unbeneficial, 
one should on no account utter it. When one knows covert speech to be true, correct, and unbeneficial, one should try not to utter it. But when one knows covert speech to be true, correct, and beneficial, one may utter it, knowing the time to do so. Here because, when one knows overt sharp speech to be untrue, incorrect, and unbeneficial, one should on no account utter it. When one knows overt sharp speech to be true, correct, and unbeneficial, one should try not to utter it. But when one knows overt sharp speech to be true, correct, and beneficial, one may utter it, knowing the time to do so. Um, I'm I'm so sorry. It, it, I mean, what what is what is um uh, covered speech? Overt sharp speech behind people's back. I think which one? Covert. Covert. Uh, Rahul means in private, like private speech about someone without them hearing it. And overt sharp and, speech and means to someone's face, like criticizing someone to their face. But it's harsh, right? Well, harsh, yeah. Harsh is when you say something bad about someone. I mean, the idea is saying something bad about someone else. If you do it in private, it's usually a bad thing. If you do it to someone's face, well, it's also usually usually a bad thing, but not always. So it's basically talking about uh, pisunavacha and parasita. Yeah, basically. Bhante, when covert speech can be beneficial, can be ever beneficial? Yeah, if you suppose, I mean, take a simple example. Your children are are hanging out with bad kids you can say you know really those kids are on in in a bad way you should not hang out with them yeah or, or your friend is not dating a drug dealer somebody who's <laughs> a woman I... are you yes. are you judgmental towards drug dealers <clears throat> sorry no i mean i i was saying to sankha that we should not be judgmental towards drug dealers <laughs> well <laughs> you mean you would allow my point was sorry um my point was um we can all make our case beneficial right but we don't know actually it is beneficial or not mm-hmm. only an experienced mm-hmm. teacher can I mean, can tell. Yeah. Yeah. Drug, as long as the drug dealer is not caught probably as his wife people might have a comfortable life but you would still don't want that for your friend right yeah yeah i mean i don't think i don't think there's anything wrong with being judgmental towards drug dealers it's a bad thing to do Uh, I mean, judgmental towards the person, again, it relates to the sutta. It's not being judgmental towards the person. You sometimes have to tell people, hey, that person's a drug dealer. Maybe they didn't know. It's like um, if, if uh, suppose two people are friends and you think, oh, I, I, I want to be this person's friend. I want to I wanna be the, this person's best friend. So I'll break them up with their best friend and say, hey, did you hear about what this person did? They said this bad thing. And of course, if it's untrue, that's the worst kind of wickedness. But even if it's true, it's generally not beneficial and your intentions are not pure. But if it's um, your friend is you're concerned about them and you think, oh, they're getting caught up in this person and they don't know that this person's a drug dealer. And of course, drug dealer isn't the worst thing you can say about someone. But let's say they're a drug addict or they're a thief, they're a liar. And maybe this person doesn't know. And so telling them can be quite beneficial. And it's okay to be judgmental. I mean, um it it goes to what your relationship is your relationship with say your your child well you have a duty i mean it's reasonable to assume that you should say these things to your children hey that that person is uh, is problematic i mean you, or your student probably the best and most accurate example is as a monastic teacher suppose you have a new monk and the new monk is hanging out with bad monks monks who have uh, are having struggling with their practice let's say you say oh don't hang out with those monks or uh, maybe just stay to yourself but if it is in front of them that's okay that sounds okay but if it is behind their back does it sound okay that behind their back i'm saying something about them and i'm thinking that sure. this is easier yeah. sure i mean it it depends on the intention and on the expected result if you say it in such a way like oh those people are bad we should uh, we should scorn them or we should we should uh, we're better than them that sort of thing if if there's that kind of attitude of course that's wrong but for a teachers responsibility is only towards their student so if these other monks are say not taking the teacher as their student then you can say oh, be careful about those ones i mean talking about some monks who are really not practicing well lazy greedy sitting around gossiping all the time that sort of thing these are all human characteristics don't they but then if i say something bad behind their back i'm actually creating hatred towards them maybe right the buddha said as the buddha said it's problematic 
but you may not be creating hatred, not if you say it in the right way, to the, at the right time, to the right person. It might make them say, oh yeah, I should, I should not be so enthusiastic about sitting around chatting with these other monks. I should not take them as my example. Sometimes for new monks, it, it, you see other monks, you say, oh, this must be the right way to be a monk. And then your teacher says, mm, that's not the right way. And sometimes it can relate to people. Again, you're onto the right idea here because of course most of the time it's problematic that's why the buddha said uh, you should be very careful when to say it but it can be valued at the right time the right to the right usually uh, visunavacha is uh, motivated by jealousy hey, don't uh, inform a friend about uh, a danger regarding for her as uh, you are like well, that's friendship. the most that's the most obvious but it can also be conceit it can also be arrogance yeah. And it can also be dangerous even if you don't have any of those things because the person you tell can be liable to all those things. You, you might wish to warn someone off of someone else and then because they learn about it, they get angry or they become uh, they become demeaning or start to look down on the other, on that person. Someone they used to esteem, suddenly they look down upon, they gain conceit. So you have to be careful of how the person you tell it to is going to receive it as well. But I mean, it's quite common, I think, for a teacher, say, or a parent to show point things out that the student or the child doesn't see. That can be quite helpful. Thank you, Bhante. Just got to be careful with it. It's dangerous. That's why I mentioned it. And also, according to the Singhala Vadrata, one of the true friends type is one who gives good count. Still, usually probably better to say, this, this is the wrong one, rather than say, these people are the wrong people. So it was there. So it was with reference to this that it was said. One should not utter speech and one should not utter covert sharp speech. One should not utter overt sharp speech. One should speak hurriedly, hurriedly. So it was said. Reference to what? What was this said? Here yeah, because speaks hurriedly. One's body grows tired and excited. One's voice is strained and one's throat becomes speech of one who's hurriedly is indistinct, hard to unhear because when one speaks unhurriedly, one's body does grow tired, nor does, nor does one's mind become excited. One's voice is not strained, nor does one's throat become speech, one, and the speech of one who speaks in hurry is distinct and easy to understand. So it was with reference to this that it was said, one should speak unhurriedly. Number 12. One should not insist on local language. One should not insist on local language and one should not override normal usage. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, uh, how, because does, how because does there come to be insistence on local language and overriding of normal usage? Here, yeah, because in different localities, they, they call the same thing a dish, a bowl, a vessel, a saucer, a pan, a pot, or a basin, so whatever they call it, in such and such a locality, one speaks accordingly, firmly adhering to, to that expression and insisting only this is correct, anything else is wrong. This is how there comes to be instance on local language and overriding normal usage. Note 1262. One, one, this problem of insistence Systems on local language must have been particularly acute to the acute in the Sangha when the bhikkhus lived a life of constant wandering and had to pass through through many localities, each with with their distant distinct dialect. And how bhikkhus does there come to be non-insistence on local language and non-overriding of normal usage? Here, yeah, because in different localities, they call the same thing a dish or a basin. So whatever they call it in such and such a locality, without adhering to that expression, one speaks accordingly thinking, these venerable ones, it seems, are speaking with reference to this. This is how there comes to be non-insistence on local language and non-overriding of normal usage. So it was with reference to this, that it was said, and one should not insist on local language and one should not override normal usage. 13. Here, because the pursuit of the enjoyment of one whose pleasure is linked to sensual desires, low, etc., and unbeneficial, 
is a state beset by suffering, vexation, despair, and fever. And it is the wrong way. Therefore, this is a state with conflict. Here, because disengagement from the pursuit of the enjoyment of one whose pleasure is linked to sensual desires, low, etc., and unbeneficial, is a state without suffering, vexation, despair, and fever. And it is the right way. Therefore, this is a state without conflict. Here, because the pursuit of self-mortification, painful, ignoble, and un unbeneficial, is a state beset by suffering, vexation, despair, and fever. And it is the wrong way. Therefore, this is a state with conflict. Here, because disengagement from the pursuit of self-mortification, painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial, is a state without suffering, vexation, despair, and fever. And it is the right way. Therefore, this is a state without conflict. Here, because the middle way discovered by the Tathagata avoids both these extremes, giving vision, giving knowledge, it leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to, to, to Nibbana. It is a state without suffering and it is the right way. Therefore, this is a state without conflict. Here, because extolling, extolling and disparaging and failure to teach only the Dhamma is a state beset by suffering, and it is the wrong way. Therefore, this is a state with conflict. Here, bhikkhus, not extolling and not disparaging and teaching only the Dhamma is a state without suffering, and it is the right way. Therefore, this is a state without conflict. Here, bhikkhus, a sensual pleasure, I'm sorry, here, bhikkhus, sensual pleasure, a filthy pleasure, a coarse pleasure, and an ignoble pleasure is a state beset by suffering, and it is the wrong way. Therefore, this is a state with conflict. Here, because the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment, is a state without suffering, and it is the right way. Therefore, this is a state without conflict. Here, because covert speech that is untrue, incorrect, and unbeneficial, is a state beset by suffering. Therefore, this state this is a state with conflict. Here, because covert speech that is true, correct, and unbeneficial is a state beset by suffering. Therefore, this is a state with conflict. Here, because covert speech that is true, correct, and beneficial is a state without suffering. Therefore, this is a state without conflict. Here, because overt sharp speech that is untrue, incorrect, and unbeneficial is a state beset by suffering. Therefore, this is a state with conflict. Here, because overt sharp speech that is true, correct, and unbeneficial is a state beset by suffering. Therefore, this is a state with conflict. Here, because overt sharp speech that is true, correct, and beneficial is a state without suffering. Therefore, this is a state without conflict. Here, because, Here because the speech of one who speaks really is a state beset by suffering vexation, despair, and fever, it is the wrong way. Therefore, this is a state with conflict. Here, because the speech of one who speaks unhurriedly is a state without suffering. Therefore, this is a state without conflict. Here, because insistence on local language and overriding of normal usage is a state beset by suffering. Therefore, this is a state with conflict. Here, because non uh, insisting on local language and non overriding of normal uses is a state without suffering, vexation, despair, and fever, and it is the right way. Therefore, this is a state without conflict. Therefore, because you should train yourself thus, we shall know the state with conflict and we shall know the state without conflict. And knowing this, we shall enter upon the way without conflict. Now, because Subhuti is a Clansman who was entered upon the way without conflict. Note uh, 1263. Venerable Subhuti was the younger brother of Anathapi Dikha and became a bhikkhu on the day Jeta's grove was offered to the Sangha. The Buddha appointed him the foremost disciple in two categories those who live without conflict and those who are worthy of gifts. That is what Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's world. Sad. 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 Sad.
suffering, vexation, and despair aren't they the mental suffering? But fever is like physical, right? I think that's um, very la. It's just another word for the the vexation set. It makes you feverish. It does actually cause heat in the body, off passion, thing. But because of because of its association with these hot feelings in the body, it's uh, recognized as a sort of a fever. But should we call uh, the temperature increase in the temperature same as fever? Fever is different, right? It's like fighting for the immunity, the cells. So we understand fever, but fever. Like we use this word in English in the same way. It's just, it's he's what he's when he says fever here, he's using it metaphorically, I guess. But we use it like that in English. We say something rose to a fever pitch, or say it of people who are angry and fever. They can uh, or greedy. They can be feverish. I see. Okay, thank you. It's because of how we associate, uh, how we think of fever, what what it evokes in us. When you say fever, you think of a very abnormally hot temperature, you, an uncomfortable state, a state that is uh, extreme. There's some of those characteristics of lust and anger, even uh, to some extent delusion, arrogance, extreme arrogance, extreme conceit, those sorts of things are kind of feverish in a way. And you can feel the effects in the body as a fever as well. Someone who's very angry, is, feels and their blood boils. Thank you, Vante. Yeah, some people even die also. I think that can lead to blood, bloody. It can lead to throat or the nose is, I guess, more common. A bloody nose can because of anger, blood rushing to the brain. Bante, could you could you give me an uh, example for when, uh, let's say, a sharp, over its charge speech is true and correct, but is unbeneficial? Uh, often, when you when you point out people's flaws, they get angry. That's a common example. Like if you see your, but your you cannot fellow, predict. Your, you can't predict if they be, will be angry about it. Or can you? Well, it would be most unbeneficial if you had bad intentions. Mm. If you intended to make the person angry, then it's of course unbeneficial to you. I mean, just be careful not to mix abhidhamma with with practicality. Practically, we talk about things being beneficial or unbeneficial, and yeah, we acknowledge we we're not sure, but. Like in an ultimate sense, beneficial only refers to yourself. Mm-hmm. Something is beneficial or unbeneficial based on how it affects your mind. But in 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 conventional sense, we talk about things being beneficial to others. And so we, if 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 you're in, I mean, the, the the mean the purpose of this speech is to show to to point out to you why you're doing things and to notice when you're not doing it to benefit the other person. Sometimes you're doing it because you're angry. Sometimes you're doing it because you want to make the other person angry. Maybe you're jealous and you feel like you're inferior to them. Maybe there's conceit and maybe you feel like you're superior to them and you want to oppress them. But but also there can be a, a blind sense of it being right to point out people's flaws. Well, the Buddha said this is wrong, so I should go around and point out other people's flaws. To so you don't even think of whether it's going to actually be beneficial. That's not the point. You just think it's right. It's right. Because this is wrong, I have to go and correct everybody else. I have to go and point out to them everything they're doing wrong. Lots of reasons why you might criticize someone else. Some people are just naturally critical, and there can be different reasons. It makes them feel better. It can be just a wrong view, thinking that that's right. It's right practice. You know, it's logical. This is wrong. Therefore, anyone who does it is wrong. Therefore, telling them that it's wrong is right. It's always important to be right. It's not always right to try to convince others that I mean, other people know that what's right and what's wrong is, yeah, you have to think of it as being beneficial. So you may not know whether it's beneficial, but you can at least uh, pure intention. Yeah, I think, I, think I, I probably have a really strong problem with this. Uh, I'm, I'm just um, trying to say that um, even if you don't say anything, you can still think it. So that's equal, right? Like or or similar. Yeah, but you're thinking in terms of abhidhamma, in terms of well, not in terms of meditation. This is a more of a worldly, conventional, living your life kind of thing. Speech is mm-hmm. is is far more powerful than just just thinking it. When you speak it, it's kind of irrevocable and it creates conflict with other people and that sort of thing. It's it's much worse. Right? Okay. It has a greater potential for disrupting your practice. Let's say. You think it well. You, you can work on that, and you can say, "Oh, look at me thinking these critical thoughts." But when you say something critical, oh, now you've got this person who hates you, and you're going to have to deal with them every day. And even if you fix it yourself, maybe they'll plot your your murder or something, like Devadatta. Yeah, but certainly that... interrupt your practice. 
But that helps you to that. you saying yeah. that it's less lesser lesser of a problem than saying yeah. it. You ever lived in a monastery? Sometimes you say something and it was a mistake, or even if it was well intentioned. Oh, suddenly you have a monk who hates you and tries to destroy you. And it hurts their practice, of course. They might be just a new monk who's struggling, and then you say something and suddenly they're your enemy and animosity. That's what the, the, there's often talk about uh, ending an animosity or a, enmity because in, in, especially in monastic set well in the world as well you can see it of course but in monastic settings because you're living so close and there's such a diversity and you're not family and you don't have a history with each other it's easy to create factions and schisms are not as far fetched as it seem living in harmony and close contact with John so these kind of talks are especially important in a monastic setting. You don't come together even because you're friends, usually. You know, a monastery with many monks doesn't come together saying, oh, look at these people, I want to be their friends. It's usually wanting to, well, reference to the teacher often, but it's about your own practice. It often doesn't take into account the compatibility of all the participants in our meditation center. People don't come here thinking who's meditating here at this time. Luckily, at a meditation center, we tell meditators not to converse with each other. But in monasteries, it's long-term. So conflict resolution. Is... Categorization, what the... Well, there's, um, there's Raga Charita, Titi Charita. I, I know those. I know those. So the, it's the same? Just those two. And okay. then Samatha Yanika, Vipassana Yanika. Mm -hmm. Raga Charita it depends uh, whether they have strong wisdom or weak wisdom. If they have weak wisdom, they focus mostly on kaya and strong wisdom, they focus on veda. And for titi charita, if they have weak wisdom, they should focus on chitta nubhas. If they have strong wisdom, dhamma. It doesn't mean they shouldn't know to all of them. It's just they're going to they're gonna have the most struggle and most potential benefit with one or another of the satipatthana. I mean, it's going to come out anyway. It's not really important. But it can also help the teacher to recognize and Focus on what the person, what the meditator is going to benefit most. Can recognize whether someone's rago. Look at what they're going to struggle struggle with most. I, I'm a little lost with the diti, uh, the the diti one. Like, um, would that be like equal, equivalent with the uh, fate, fate type of no, person? Views. If, if one views, is, is very into views and opinions, that's diti uh -huh. If one is very much passionate, that's raga. There's two basic types of problem people. One is very passionate, the other is very, let's say, intellectual or... Opinionated. Yeah, opinionated. Okay. okay. So we have uh, six, but even after following all those formulas, you would still get it wrong. It reminds me of student of Venerable Saripur goes tried for a couple of months without any problem. After the game, different meditation, meditating, because he, he was, he, his, uh, he had, he was a handsome person, so he might be a lustful character. He gave him, I think, a uh, high, particular monster, I'm not, but I didn't, but... Uh, then he, then Sariputta took him to the Buddha. The Buddha said, come in the evening, ready. Then the Buddha gave him like a golden lotus flower and told him. So that worked the same. So it's very tricky. So there is a um, mention of this um, Bhikkhu Subhuti or Venerable Subhuti. And I'm just, I'm just thinking is um, okay that he had no conflict with anyone or anything. Uh, but for example, like um, Venerable Sariputta kept, kept having these people who were just wanting to have conflict. So you can't really avoid it, right? Like, yeah, I mean, some people this, can be jealous. Is, is this right. like the special ability that he could avoid conflict? I mean, the way you speak, you can avoid it up to a degree, but some people just get jealous for no reason. They get jealous for what you have or the status you have or the... Exactly. You get from others. He's, he's just practicing according to this teaching. He notices that what he's just taught, well, there's a monk who embodies it to sing this way. I think Mahaputta uh, compared himself to the earth. Earth doesn't care whether people dig it or spit on it, do any uh, like doesn't react at all. This was when some monk, I think, uh, said something bad about it. And then the Buddha questioned him. I mean, I'm just thinking if you're like, most not not noticeable you know you're not really doing much or saying much or whatever even if you're an arahant but opposed to a, a, another arahant that involved and i don't know maybe even teaching or so yeah people will you have 
issues and you're going to get into conflict uh, i think yeah if you stay in the forest it will not be a big interact with the society yeah. we, we didn't say anything about um or we didn't really ask any questions about um like speaking hurriedly and unhurriedly i mean for me it's pretty important uh understand english if someone speaks taking taking their unhurriedly basically and if someone speaks very hurriedly it's really hard to understand i guess it's about uh, finding the right speed like if you speak too fast people get uh, annoyed and wouldn't want to pay attention to you and if you speak too slow people get bored of what you're saying still they will get annoyed it's kind of like a uh, walking meditation it's supposed to walk very fast supposed to walk very slow find the right another example for uh, speaking the truth not leading to any benefit is like for example let's say your friend invite you to his wedding and then when they are getting married you up everyone and say you are just creating more uh father and creating more attachment and this is going to lead to suffering <laughs> you're saying that it's not going to lead to any benefit they are just going to get annoyed and kick you out why are you keep saying or giving examples about marriage i didn't even stop that ever <laughs> Well, these are practical examples. You you sound suspicious to me. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I think it is more relatable to when you live with somebody layman, typical layman. So you have to be able to relate to those situations. Just thinking about meditation. Yes, I'll think. Go ahead. I was just um, reflecting that this whole sutta is um, actually so uh, uh, dependent on mindfulness. simply because the whole thing is based on beneficial and that's such a thing related to mindfulness like so many things look like it's beneficial but it's not like pleasure and so many things look like it's not beneficial like speaking harsh and true things uh when it's beneficial but that, that's kind of difficult sometimes uh but that's beneficial and to have that judgment is actually very much related to mindfulness and meditation uh without which Uh, it's almost impossible to implement this sutta i think this sutta is only for the teachers monk teachers uh it's not possible for us to find out or justify whether a covert or overt speech is beneficial i can see among us we misuse overt speech but if bante says something about us we will not will not be angry on bante because we know that that is beneficial for us but i'll not be happy to hear something from someone else that what are my mistakes no actually you can implement this as a lay person i mean if you have kids like mate said if you have kids and you have to instruct them in the but i think i think we are missing we almost always miss you them uh, it depends like uh, whether what is whether i mean you have to have a uh i call the idea of whether the moment is right or not i mean it comes with the experience whether the situation is okay to uh, start this uh, certain topic i don't know kind of two different two different things if you to know what is right and what is wrong is one thing and then to let other people know what is right and what is wrong it's another thing or let let people know things based on that like yes it's true you might not have common sense but that's a different problem than telling someone based on that if you if you have not common sense probably the bad common sense is not the right word if you have sense and wisdom then you have to make decisions based on when and how to express that and sometimes expressing that saying things that are that are critical of others but rarely it's the buddha was clear that this is a dangerous one and it's one that wise people tend to shy away from will often just say stay silent but at time and uh, you know fairly commonly they say it in the right way like if someone asks me about other meditation traditions i have to be careful not to say oh those ones are bad because they're not as good because ours is the best and because they're not us but you can say you know this meditation tradition well this is what they say and uh, that's that's problematic the the buddha um, the buddha would often or on on multiple occasions pointed out the problem with hanging out with devadatta he said that devadatta is a terrible person basically 
And it was even brought up in the Melinda Panha. King Melinda asks uh, Nagasena, well, what, what the heck is the Buddha doing here? Isn't this, a, isn't this harsh speech where he says Devadatta is bad and evil? But it was important because there were people who followed after Devadatta, new monks who thought, oh, Devadatta is what he's saying makes sense. We should follow him. And the Buddha had to say something to stop everyone from being misled by Devadatta's trickery. People can be tre treacherous. They can trick you. They can they can uh, praise you and make you feel good about yourself. And then you think, oh, look at this teacher. He must know what he's talking about. He says, I'm so great. It can be very hard to dissuade people who have been hypnotized by such manipulations. Sometimes you have to be a little bit direct. But far too often it's done poorly and causes more problems. Most often you just got to keep quiet, for sure. And and too often people think they have right intentions and they really don't. They're kind of conceited. They think they know what's best and they say it because they think they know best. We have, we have to recognize that a lot of what we say is problematic or not perfect. And we have to be most careful with speech. It's dangerous. Yeah, but, but I, I agree with Satura in, I mean, for unwise person like us, basically, the normal person, uh, it's extremely difficult to avoid conflict uh, if you speak, even like, uh, you know. It's well, far better to just stay quiet most right. of the time. Yeah, right. So that... Uh, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have that inferiority is called hina. No, even, even in the family with kids, uh, we are experiencing on a daily basis. It's, 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 it's uh, extremely difficult to avoid the conflict, basically. If you start speaking, even... That's true and, uh, you know, correct. And we also think that's beneficial to kids. It's, you cannot avoid conflict by speaking. It's just... Uh, yeah, and you can't be expected to be a really good teacher either. That's why right. a lot of Buddhists bring, bring their yeah. children to experience. Right, because we teachers. are very unwise people, right? We, we haven't gained... Sort of well, you're wisdom. also very distracted by the world. Even if right. you're not uh, not unwise, you're, you're not generally in a good state of mind. Bringing children to monks is is a thing because not necessarily because the monks are just because the monks are wise, but the monks are kind of free from all the yeah. distractions. Their mind their minds are peaceful and settled, yeah. and they don't have all the, the busyness of mind that. Parents have it makes it hard for parents to teach children, for example. You can't really be expected to, as lay people, to to even even as monks, but m much more as lay people. I mean, generally, you shouldn't be you shouldn't expect to be the teacher unless you're the Buddha. You really shouldn't expect exactly. to be the teacher. Right. You know, and on and that's why staying silent is even for arahants, but far more for yeah. Yeah, in, 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 uh, uh, yeah, I myself found staying Just silent stay quiet. is is. is more helpful than like you know speaking although you i mean you think that is true and beneficial and everything uh in in most of the cases like you know that, the, that, that cannot avoid conflict but that comes with experience you try a certain way you don't succeed you try and succeed so that gives you experience okay in this situation talking like this will not uh, yield good in this situation like this it will yield good it comes with experience no that that is also is uh, i don't think we have such level of the guidance available right these are very high level outlines i i in in practical i'm talking about in practical sense uh, sangha in theory yeah i understand that what you're saying or you this way that way but what is the other way i don't know right so it's, knowledge comes from experience. So no, that experience also doesn't help because the, the experience, yeah, you, 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 as you're raising the kid, you know, like you know, it's a, it's, it's a very, very. You are, going, you are going to succeed every time, but right. when you, even when you fail, you uh, put that down as experience. You know that. No, I, I'm I'm talking about avoiding the conflict. Basically, can you really avoid the conflict? Uh, uh, but, maybe. Maybe avoid, yeah, avoiding if avoiding a conflict is your like ultimate goal. It's the, that's what I'm saying. The avoiding the conflict, uh, other than you know the the, the keeping maybe quiet. You for, maybe you are doing it for you, uh, like uh, you don't want to be in an uncomfortable situation. Maybe you are doing it for yourself sometimes. So it can it can vary. Your motives can, vary. and also if you read the Singhala or the Sutta, it clearly mentions that. Uh, in four ways, a uh, householder, there should there should be one who gives good counsel, uh, be understood as a warm-hearted friend. So it is warm-hearted. He restrains one from doing evil. He en 
encourages one to do good and he informs one of what is unknown to oneself and he points out the path to heaven. So this cannot be just uh, the Buddha. There can be others as well, even lay people. Of course, Buddha is the best uh, type of friend one can have. Uh, below that level can be other lay people. We call them uh, Kappurisa. This also reminds me of the story of Gatikara, Jyotipala. Bodhisattva. Well, I mean, you're giving the example of the wise people. I'm talking about the uh, the general, like, you know, unwise people. Can you give some example on yeah, general? On... If you are guided by guided by the Dhamma, if you're in triple gen, then the obviously the counsel you give is uh, guided by the Dhamma. So if if you're, you're, you're not supposed to guide people who are above you, you know people. No, no, no. The, 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 you, hear, you hear the question of, like, you know, the in, in general lay people's life in, in today's life even with interacting with uh, kids I mean, I mean, you, you, it's uh, yeah, applying the Dhamma there is in my opinion more unbeneficial than I can, uh, you I know. can, I can confidently say that I learned a lot my parents, my parents advice so they are they were not the monk without their advice I would be in a very different place right yeah, yeah called, that's why I call Pubbacharya it is um it is an issue where people feel uh, averse to helping others out of concern for their own peace of mind, where you don't want to be bothered. But it cuts both ways, because why should you be bothered? The Buddha didn't even want to be bothered. Right. Yeah. The Buddha yeah. thought, well, why am I going to teach people? So it has to be... The, the point really in this sutta is that, I mean, well, in that particular part of the sutta is that uh, you have to be careful there's so many problems with trying to help others, but there are problems with staying silent as well. There are times where it is the right thing to do to help others. I, I would just remark that most often people help others or speak out, not not out of purity, but the majority of speech is, is uh, problematic. There's lots of issues like the desire to to prove a point, or for example, or the desire to manipulate others. There's conceit where you feel like uh, you feel good about showing how you're, you're you know the dhamma, for example, that kind of thing. There's lots of issues. Uh, the the uh, uh, important point that I think the Buddha points out here is is the majority of times you should not speak. Speech should be sparing. Speech should be careful and. Just because you're right doesn't mean telling other people what's right is going to be beneficial. That's a big problem. We think that if we're right, that uh, expressing that is always going to be the right thing to do. And most often it's not. Not to say it's always not, but sparing. For sure, speech should be sparing. Mm. The Buddha was, was much more praise, praising of silent than speech. And it's not to say you should just always stay silent. That's a bad rule as well, of course. Of course it is. No, no, I understand you that. You have to speak at times. But mostly, more more not speaking than speaking. And that's not, that, that you don't under, interpret that as not speaking at all. You yeah. speak when it's going to be the right time to speak. And that's, right. Right. as I think that's you that's rightfully right. point out, it's hard to, hard to know. Right. But right. just but, because it's hard to know doesn't mean you should not try to know or you should not try, as Sanka says, try and learn. But too often people just, not, they're not trying to learn. They're just doing without concern and just talking and talking and talking. And that's all for me this week. Thank you, my discussion. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you so much for the day. Thank you. Thank you.